On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, one out of five ships in the U.S. Navy do not have sailors aboard. Instead, they have merchant mariners. Let's go sailing with the Military Sealift Command. Hi, I'm your host, Sam Mercagliano. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Well, one out of five vessels in the U.S. Navy don't have sailors on board. If I told you that one out of five divisions of the U.S. Army or battalions of the U.S. Marine Corps or squadrons of the U.S. Air Force were crewed by non-military members, you'd be shocked and surprised about it. Yet 20% of the vessels in the U.S. Navy don't have sailors on board. Instead, they have civilian merchant mariners. And they operate for an outfit called the Military Sealift Command, the largest fleet in the US Navy, over 110 ships operated by a two-star admiral in Norfolk, Virginia. Yet most people have never heard of them before. And not only have they not heard of about them before, they're unaware of serious problems with that entity and problems that could lead to potential problems in a war scenario. So let's take a look at the Military Seal of Command and the issues associated with it. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So my background with the Military Seal of Command goes quite a bit back. So when I graduated from the State University of New York Maritime College in 1989, my first job was sailing for the Military Sea Lift Command. I sailed for three years with them. That is me on board the hospital ship USNS Comfort with uh, a Navy nurse I happened to meet on there who, by the way, we're celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary this year. Uh, I know it's, it's uncanny. I look identical. I have not changed. I know it's, it's just absolutely identical. So I worked for Military Seal Command for three years, and then I went ashore and worked for them at their headquarters in Washington, D.C., in the Washington Navy Yard, back when the Washington Navy Yard was not a place you wanted to work at, but worked for them for four years down there. And then I embarked on my academic career where I literally wrote the book on Military Seal of Command. This is my doctoral dissertation on the history of military sea lift from the Spanish-American War to the Iraq War. So if you ever need some sleeping, they're guaranteed I got something that will put you right asleep. But the Military Sea Lift Command is a unique entity. And one of the things I think that is not really appreciated is the role they play. This is their website. This is the uh, Military Sea Lift Command website. Uh, and it features all the elements on it. Now, one of the things that's very prevalent in their website is lots of pictures of MSC ships. If you look at their photos they have, they're all almost all taken from Navy vessels of MSC ships. But what you almost never see in any of the pictures are MSC mariners, those merchant mariners who crew the vessels. Yet you'll see them playing a instrumental role in their operations. Here, you see one of the MSC oilers refueling an aircraft carrier. Here, they're ref uh, one of the uh, dry cargo replenishment vessels and ammo ships uh, doing a underway replenishment with a uh, Burke-class destroyer, the McCain. Here, you see not just a underway replenishment, but a vertical replenishment underway. These ships provide the stores, the dry bulk, the ammunition, the food, the fuel, the toilet paper, everything needed by the U.S. Navy. And as I mentioned to you before, of the 300 ships in the U.S. Navy, 60 of them are operated by the Military Sea Lift Command. And if you look at a list of ships in the Military Sea Lift Command, this is their poster they have where they list all the vessels. Uh, they do this every year. They come out with this poster, uh, updated all the time. And one of the things you'll see here is of the 110 ships, about half of them are crewed by merchant mariners in the direct employ of the US government. The other half are merchant mariners who are contracted through unions and shipping companies. And when you break it down, if you look at the ships in general, this is kind of the workforce that MSC employs. And this is from their uh, handbook of 2020. You'll see nearly 5,600 mariners, civil service mariners. These, these are what they call them. They call them CIVMARS. And I hate that term because it kind of dilutes who they are. It's an acronym that most people, even within the Navy, don't understand. But nearly 5,600 mariners are employed 
by the military seal of command and then another 1400 commercial mariners. And if you look at the total personnel of military seal of command, nearly 10,000, very few of them are military. Only 340 are active component military. There's roughly another thousand reserve component. <clears throat> and then about 1400 uh, civilians. When you look at the type of vessels that uh, military seal of command, those uh, civilian merchant mariners man, uh, those include vessels like the Expeditionary Fast Transport Vessels, the EPFs. And you can always tell an MSC ship by the fact that its uh, designator, the letters that are used, and then the hull number, have in front of them a T uh, designator. That T was put in place back in 1949 when the precursor to MSC, the Military Sea Transportation Service, was created. Uh, the hospital ships, the Mercy and the Comfort, for example, have civil service merchant mariners on board. The over the dozen in dry cargo and ammunition ships that provide, again, that ammunition, the food, the mail, the dry provisions, the fuel, repair parts, everything they need are on there. Uh, the underway replenishment vessels, the 15 Kaiser class, soon to be replaced by the new John Lewis class. Oilers are out there. Uh, cable laying ships like the Zeus out there. The rescue and salvage vessels. We just saw one of those rescue salvage vessels go out to help the Peruvian uh, Navy vessel Guise that caught fire during RIMPAC. Uh, also, you see the fleet tugs down there. And then you see even a more interesting one, uh, two subtenders, a command ship, and uh, three expeditionary mobile bases. Those vessels have on board both Navy and civilian crews. They have civilian crews to operate the vessels. They staff the deck department, the engineering department, the steward department, the food basically on board, but they also have Navy crews on board. And the overall command of that vessel is under a Navy captain. And so the Navy captain commands the vessel, but underneath him, he has like almost like the old days of sail, a sailing master who operates the vessel and oversees the civilian component, hence the hybrid nature. And then two last uh, fast combat support vessels that are in the fleet. So I want to talk about four issues that I think critically impact the ability of the military seal of command to do their mission. Now, let me be clear. I'm a huge, huge proponent of the military seal of command. Literally wrote the book on it, met my wife on board. I write about it all the time. I firmly believe the military seal of command is a great entity and organization and I have absolute respect for everybody who does it and involved in it. Let me be, again, 100% clear about it. This is not an attack on the military seal of command. However, one of the things I do think is there are issues they do that need to be addressed. There are four critical issues that need to be talked about. And that involves basically the issue of the status of the merchant mariners on board, the leadership that is being exercised over the military seal of command, the kind of leave and uh, leave policy that's associated with working on board these vessels, and then finally the readiness of the vessels. So I'm going to look at those four issues, kind of break them down, and talk about them. So first thing I want to talk about is the readiness of the vessels, and I think the readiness of the vessels is really important. This is a secondary site. This is the the site for civil service mariners employment. So the site I showed you initially, that's the MSC main webpage. This site, sealofcommand.com, is basically where employees, uh, people wanting to join the military seal of command could go. And what I want to show you here is this. This is their now hiring page. This is basically who is hiring in military seal of command. And understand, they're hiring everybody. The only people who are not on this list that they're hiring are masters of the vessel and chief engineers. First officer, salary, $82,000 a year with a $41,000 bonus. Uh, second officers, third officers, damage control offices, assistant damage control, you name it. They have a slew of people involved here on this. In the engine department, the first assistant engineer, that's the person just below the chief engineer, all the way down to the second, to the third assistant engineer, to the electricians, to the uh, uh, junior uh, engineers on board, to the unlicensed on board, the yeoman storekeepers who move the cargo around the vessel, the stewards who cook and maintain the food for the vessels, the communications officers 
on board, the medical service officers. We're talking about they are hiring for every position in this. Understand, Military Seal of Command is the largest employer of U.S. merchant mariners in the world. Nobody hires more merchant mariners than the Military Seal of Command. And based on the salaries you're seeing there, it looks like a pretty good job. These are government jobs, too. So you get government benefits. Uh, it's a government job with government money, and it's usually pretty damn good. Yet, why is it that they are looking for nearly everybody for every position on board? So MSC operates in this kind of quasi-military uh, stature where they use rank structures similar to the U.S. Navy, but they divide it up so that you'll see, for example, a master is equivalent to a uh, captain, a chief engineer is equivalent to a, a 06 captain, and then first assistant, second assistant, third assistant, you know, the ranks are basically right there. So you have an, an idea of, of how the structure goes. But one of the things I think is really important is understanding how it works when you get into the employ of military sea lift command. And one of the most important things there has to do with the readiness of the vessel. Uh, MSC vessels, unlike US Navy vessels, don't operate under operation and personnel tempo. So they don't have that same level. You're not required to ensure that they're ready, you know, 50% of the time or that personnel tempo is their home 50% of the time. These are civilians. You don't have to operate at that level. And I think that at times MSC plays a little bit with those numbers. So for example, if you have a MSC oiler, which has a crew of about 80 to 90 on board, if you have 90% fill on board those vessels, in other words, 90% of the billets are filled, that sounds really good on a Navy ship, that's fantastic. If you're a Navy destroyer with 300 people, that sounds really good. You've got 90% filled, you have, you have some redundancy. But on a commercial MSC vessel, there's no redundancy. Everyone is needed for the jobs they have. There is no slack. If you have a third officer, you're the third officer. That's it. If you're the second officer, you're the second officer. First officer, first officer, master, master. There is no redundancy here. And if you gap one of those billets, you have created a, a problem where the vessel is not meeting a certificate of inspection. It doesn't have the requisite crew on board. And so it's really important that you maintain the fill on board these vessels. The fact that MSC is hiring that many different positions should give concern that what is the readiness of these vessels to deploy? Because unlike a normal M Navy vessel where you assume, okay, one out of four vessels is ready to deploy, you know, or one out of three. You know, you got one on deployment, one in the shipyard, one going on deployment, one coming from deployment. You know, MSC vessels aren't like that. One MSC vessel is either available or not. It's either available, ready to go, or it's in the yard. That's it. That, that's the status. And one of the reasons they went to civilian manning of vessels, particularly after the Vietnam War, was number one, it was cheaper. You could use less crew. You didn't need as many people on board. They were civilians. They weren't Navy. And you can keep them at sea for a heck of a lot longer than you can Navy vessels. You don't have to worry about this. And so I would argue that the readiness issue is a big one. What is the readiness of these vessels? Because you can't evaluate them based on Navy ratings. You have to evaluate them on their ability to accomplish their mission. And I think that's a really important thing. When I see crewing numbers like that, telling me that every job is available. That's telling me that some ships are, are out there. Now, let me be clear. I talk to MSC Mariners all the time. And what I'm hearing is Mariners are jumping ship from one to another to fill out the ranks, to get ships deployed while others are coming back in, coming back out. Now, that's fine in routine peacetime operations. But if you have to scale up to war, you have to have a reservoir of Mariners out there. And the way MSC identifies this is they identify how many billets they have, how many slots they have. And they assume they need 122% manning level to man the vessels out there. And the reason they do 122% has to do with their leave policy. The second issue I want to talk about. This is out of the MSC handbook, their annual leave policy. So as I mentioned to you before, I sailed for them for three years, but then I came ashore. And working ashore for MSC is different than working afloat for MSC. Matter of fact, I had to apply for a job. And I'm still a federal government employee. I just went from working afloat to ashore. I became a GS whatever. But one of the things I noticed was, man, working ashore was a heck of a lot different. 
So when you worked a float, every day you worked. Uh, mariners work every day. Every day is Monday. It's Groundhog Day. Every day is the same. You only have enough mariners on board to do the jobs necessary. So as a watch standing mate, I stood at least eight hours of watch every day. When I was on a ship, I had no days off. There's no days off. You work every day. You have to. And MSC ships, when they do underway replenishments, vertical replenishments, all these weird operations that MSC ships do, that's overtime, which is great. It's great for money. But what it also means is now you are working more hours. And that means you're getting uh, less time for yourself. When I was a federal government employee working in Washington, D.C., it was great. I worked, you know, you work on a two-week cycle. You can work a compressed work schedule where instead of working eight hours a day, you work nine hours a day so that every 10th day you get off. You're off for weekends. You're home every night. You get federal holidays, 10, 11. Now it's 11 federal holidays. I lived in D.C., which meant it snowed a lot, so there would always be federal closed days because of snow. You also have sick leave that you can burn, which you can never burn on ship because you can't get sick on ship because there's no one to replace you. And having the same rules for mariners afloat as ashore doesn't work. For example, if you are a brand new hired mariner, you're a third mate, third assistant engineer, comes out of one of the maritime schools, you get hired, according to the federal leave scale, you get four hours of leave for every pay period, every two weeks. Now, MSC says that their leave, that their policy is for you to do four months afloat, and then you come back ashore. But if you look at their leave policy, you don't get paid for all your leave because you don't have enough leave. So, you know, if you're working 12, let's say 12 weeks, that's six pay periods, you earn 24 hours of leave. That equates to three days, three eight-hour days. Now, you also get what's called shore leave. There's this thing where each year you can get up to 15 calendar days of leave. So, you know, if you're on board, you know, you earn shore leave at the rate of one day of shore leave for each 15 calendar days uh, you're on board. So if you're on board for, you know, again, let's go four months there, uh, you're on four months, that is basically eight, eight uh, days of shore leave. So you get eight days of shore leave. So that's eight days of shore leave plus three days. That's 11 days of paid leave. Now, MSC says if you do four months on a ship, they will give you one month away from the ship. But you're only getting paid for half of that because you only got enough leave for half of that. So two weeks, you're not getting paid anything. And I should also say, you're not doing four months on the ship because that's bull. I know MSC says that, but it's bullshit. Because number one, you're not getting your reliefs on time right now. I know, I know. I've talked to mariners every day. One chief mate I just talked to was on board for nine months, could not get their relief, could not get their relief. Nine months they were on board and they couldn't get off. The other thing is they're not on board ship for four months. You have to report into what's called the pool in Norfolk for your assignment. When you get a new hire, you have to go in there, but first you have to get training. You have to get all the required training. You're in all the required training. You're in all the required things. And that could be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months to get the required training. And then you're told to go out to your ship. Now, MSC doesn't look at that time you're in training as really part of your shore time. Uh, they, they'll give you leave for that. You're under federal employment and you're going to get leave for that. But when you go out to your ship and you do your four months at, at sea, you've been away from home now for three months already doing training. Now you're out at sea for four months, which by the way, isn't four months because again, you're getting relieved late. So maybe it's six months. So maybe you've been gone for nine months, nine months. And now you have to use your leave and you don't have enough leave. And at the end of a month, you're getting called. And if you don't return the calls back, you're going to be marked with leave without absence, which can impact your ability to get promoted and paid. The leave policy doesn't work if you're working ashore. You know what? Every night when I worked as a federal employee down at the Washington Navy Yard, I was in home at night in my bed. I went out with my wife for dinner. I had the weekends off. I had holidays off. I was able to schedule days off I needed for anniversary, for weddings, for birthdays, for anything I needed. You can't do that when you're at sea. Guess what? When you're off work at sea, you go to your stateroom. You're, you don't go home. You know, you're still stuck on the ship. 
And yet the government doesn't do anything for the Mariners. If you look commercially, 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 they basically operate in pairs. I have a friend who's a chief mate on one of the contract vessels operated by MSC, and he and another master trade off on their vessel. Basically, they swap. Most commercial ships are one for one. You do one month on, one month off, two months, two months, three, three. Maybe it's a little more at time. The problem here is MSC has calculated their pool of mariners at 122%, which means they have calculated for four months plus one month. 125 roughly. But the problem is they don't have sufficient mariners in the pool to do that because they're not going four months on a ship off for one and then back out again because they got several months, weeks of training in between there. And plus some mariners just take off longer. They don't answer their phone. They avoid it. They get the leave without absence and they take some time off because they know if they answer their phone, they're going to get dinged. So they take time off, which decreases the readiness of one fifth of the US Navy, which by the way, is the one that provides the replenishment for it. The way to fix this is very simple. Hire more people and improve the leave schedule. Change this leave schedule. This leave schedule works great when you're on friggin' land. It doesn't work when you're out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the Atlantic, the Pacific. It doesn't work. These people are not commuting on the Beltway, on I-95, in local towns. They are out at sea on a boat. And let's be clear too, they operate much different than anything else. So you've got veteran, you got, excuse me, a readiness status. You've got leave status. The next thing I wanna talk about is leadership. I wrote this piece for SIMSEC, the Center for International Maritime Security. Wrote it two years ago. Why Military Seal of Command needs merchant mariners at the helm. Boy, this created a little bit of a stink. I heard back on this not well from a lot of people in Military Seal of Command. I heard great things from the mariners. They love this piece. But the genesis of this piece came from an order that was initiated by the commander of Military Seal of Command, Rear Admiral Mike uh, uh, Wetlaufer, Due to COVID, he ordered something called the gangway up order. One day, the mariners arrived on their vessels. Uh, you know, either they were, you know, ships that were in port. When you're, you know, when you're in port and you're not on watch, you can go off. So you can go off, come and you go. And some of these ships are home ported out of Norfolk and San Diego. So mariners will have apartments, homes, go see people, come home. Uh, when I sailed with them, I had an apartment in Virginia. So I was able to go back and forth. Uh, but one day, these mariners show up in the ship and they're told, okay, you're not getting off. Right, gangway's up. The crew is staying on board to keep the crew safe and to keep the ship ready. Well, some of those mariners left home that day. They didn't have their gear with them. They didn't have medicine. They didn't have money. They, they parked their cars at the end of the pier and couldn't go down to the end of the pier to move their car and their cars got towed because they're not allowed to park there that long. Yet the contractors, the Navy personnel who come on board were free to come and go as they wanted to. And this prompted the three unions that represent MSC Mariners on board to write a letter together. Let me be clear, to get these three unions to agree that the sun comes up in the morning is an act of God. And yet they came together and wrote this piece. And I wrote this thing because one of the things I have argued is unlike any other command in the US Navy, it is not commanded by people who operate the vessels or the entities in the command. Aviators command aviators. Submariners command submarines. SEALs command SEALs. CBs command CBs. Surface warfare command surface ships. But MSC, nope, nope. If you go over to the leadership page of MSC, now, let me be clear. I have nothing against these people. I think they're all great. I think they have good leadership skills. I am not saying they are not good leaders. What I am saying is they lack the experience of the vessels and the type of command they're overseeing. Uh, Rear Admiral Mike Wetlaufer, for example, he's an aviator. Okay, you put an aviator in charge of military sea lift. Uh, doesn't know much about it, has no experience doing that. That's not to say you can't be a great commander. Some of the greatest MSC commanders, I've written a history about them, weren't ship drivers. Uh, Rear Admiral, uh, excuse me, uh, Vice Admiral Lawson Ram Ram Red Ramage, great commander. He was a sub commander. His experience with the Merchant Marine was sinking the Japanese Merchant Marine. <laughs> that was his experience. 
Uh, but what's really interesting is that MSC has senior executives in position. Steve Cade is the executive director. Uh, if you go down this list here, uh, Chris Thayer, who I know very well, I worked with Chris when I was at MSC, is the director of maritime operations. Tom Kiss is the director of ship management. Uh, Greg uh, Pulowski is the director of total force management. Mary Kate Domain is the counsel for military seal command. They have five SESs. Now understand MSC back in the day was commanded by a vice admiral. It had one stars in the area commands, but today it's commanded by a two star. It has captains out in those area commands. But if you look at the SESs, the senior executives, uh, Steve Cade, for example, is a Navy Academy grad. He came over from fleet forces. He doesn't have experience commanding ships in the MSC fleet. He, he just doesn't. Chris Thayer, Chris is a uh, uh, Merchant Marine grad. He's sailed commercially, but not vessels in the military seal of command. Tom Kiss, he's a Navy Academy guy. Greg Pulowski, uh, U.S. Merchant Marine, but have not sailed vessels in military seal of command. And Mary Kate Domain is, again, an attorney, really doesn't have the experience in that. But again, I'm not criticizing these people individually. What I am criticizing is why the hell is there not a senior master chief engineer in the chain of command? Why are they not the executive, the, the vice commander, the, the, the co-commander? Why are they not in this area? Because understand, MSC is within the unified command structures I'll talk about in a minute. They're in the unified command structure. They, they operate as part of the U.S. Navy fleet. And yet you're not bringing the masters and the chief engineers who have the experience to talk about these issues into the position of command. You're getting SESs, well-trained SESs, SESs who have a lot of experience, but not on the ship. The last master I sailed with, the very last master I sailed with when I was the second officer on USNS John Lenthal had sailed on 24 ships, 24. Half of them is master. That's a buttload of shipping experience right there. That is a wealth of experience. He knew everything, that guy. I, I, I thought he was a great commander. I thought he knew everything that needed to be known. Yet you don't take a person like that and bring them into the headquarters. Yes, they will bring them in, but they'll put them in some, sub, you know, kind of sub roles. They'll put them in staffing roles. They'll make them port captains. They'll make them port engineers, but they don't put them in operational and administrative command positions, which is just crazy. If you look at the comparable organization to MSC over in the Royal Navy, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, the head of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary is a Commodore, is a former chief engineer on board a vessel. The previous one was a, a former master. They, they rule it. They, they, they operate it. They, they oversee it. And they know what it's like to be out at sea and dealing with a cruddy ass leave system. They understand it. They know it. They, they deal with the issues. But instead, what we're doing in MSC right now is churning and burning through people. It's why they're looking for everybody for every position, because they're not retaining them. Because a lot of the issues that the mariners are voicing are not being heard. And I think that's a major concern. All right. The last issue deals with the status of the merchant mariners. Come back over to the MSC uh, handbook over here. Uh, this MSC handbook, again, identifies some key issues. And one of the things they're talking about here is command and control and how the vessels fit into the unified command structure. Now, the U.S. Department of Defense divides the world up into regional combatant commands, NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, UCOM, AFRICACOM, Indio Pay, uh, PAYCOM, Central Command, all of them. Well, if you are a sailing on board a logistics ship, one of the underwear replenishment vessels, a Kaiser class oiler, a Lewis and Clark class uh, dry cargo ammunition ship, a supply class fast combat ship, you are under the COCOM when you're deployed under the regional combatant commander. You're in CENTCOM's AOR, for example. If you're in the Persian Gulf, you're under the central commands area. You're under the operational command of the fifth fleet. The fifth fleet commander, the three-star admiral in charge of the fifth fleet, directs your vessel. You're under the tactical command of CTF-53. CTF-53 is the tactical commander in which you report to. CTF-53 is also co-listed as the MSC central commander. This is Mike Toth, who is that uh, submariner 
Uh, he is a uh, experienced naval officer. You can see right here where he can comes from and his background. Uh, again, he attended the ODU uh, program up at Old Dominion University, but he took over as CTF 53 commander. So he operates the Central Command's logistics forces. And if you're on an MSC ship, if you're the master of that vessel, if you're serving on that vessel, you report to him for both administrative control and also operational control. So if we come back over here, you're operating. And when you're an MSC vessel, you're giving orders at times to Navy vessels. If I'm doing an underway replenishment, I am, you know, as a navigator, I'm arranging rendezvous with Navy vessels. We're sending orders out to those vessels. We'll meet at this course, this position, sail at this course, this direction, at this speed. When you're doing the underway replenishment, you hoist up Romeo and you set the corp in which you're going to sail. You're within the unified command structure. These are not contractors. These are not contractors that are working on an overseas army base or military post. They're not the people who are cleaning the, the buildings you know, on US bases. These are mariners who are operating as sailors of the US Navy, but they're not treated as sailors of the US Navy. And that comes to my very last thing is how they're treated. They are, and I hate to say this, and I don't say it lightly, but they're treated as second-class sailors. They really are. I talked about the fact that there are those vessels out there like the expeditionary support bases that operate in full wartime environments. I mean, they have a hybrid crew. There's a Navy crew on board. There's a military crew on board. And you know, a lot of people are going to sit there and go, all right, Sal, hang on a second. You know, you're civilians. Walk away. Go do something else. You get paid good money to go do this. Go do something else. Stop griping and moaning about leave and, and, and money and everything like that, which is okay, that's fine. But you're hiring them, you're operating them. What happens if that expeditionary support base, the Lewis Polar operating in the central command area is hit by the Iranians and heaven forbid sunk, mariners killed, sailors killed. Uh, what happens if you're injured on a vessel because of enemy action or just normal work? Well, yeah, you have your own life insurance and health insurance you've paid for but you're not entitled to TRICARE. You're not entitled to the SGLI life insurance should you be killed in the line of duty operating out there. You're not entitled to housing and basing or any of the things that the military get. You don't get a DD-214 when you finish your service with military seal of command, even though you're serving right alongside US Navy sailors in a role that's complementary to them, you don't get it. You're, you're understand something. The logistics vessels of the U.S. Navy, the oilers, the, the ships that keep the U.S. Navy supplied are unarmed. There's no weapons on them except for small arms. So if, if I'm the Chinese and I'm going to fight the U.S. military, what am I going to do? Am I going to go against a battle group, command, you know, a battle group, a, a Nimitz class battle group with cruisers and destroyers? No, I'm going to go sink that unarmed tanker over there, bringing the food and fuel in for you. And I'm going to say it because I know it has no weapons on it. It has no defenses on it. RFA puts weapons and defenses on theirs. They just put some Navy crews on board to man them. The U.S. doesn't do that. Why? Because you treat them like second-class citizens. They're second-class sailors. They really are. They're cheap. They're disposable. And you can churn and burn through them and keep the, the, the ships going. And that's a terrible way. Understand, when merchant mariners were killed in World War II, they were promised veterans benefits. They were promised to be treated just like the armed forces. They were guaranteed that. They were told if they joined the merchant marine, sail for the merchant marine, they would get this. And understand when a merchant marine ship was sunk in World War II, you stopped getting paid the minute the ship sank. You were paid to be on the ship. If the ship wasn't floating, you're not getting paid. So when you're treading water in the North Atlantic because of a German U-boat, you're on your own time there. And by the way, that veterans benefit that was guaranteed to them, the GI bill that was guaranteed them, nope. Didn't get it till 1988. 1988, what's the guarantee today for merchant mariners who are wanting to serve, wanting to take a job and work for them and do it? Understand, this is all fixable. We can fix all this. This can all be fixed. The problem is when these issues come up from the fleet, who are they going to? They're going to people who, don't understand this because they haven't been out there. Where is that master chief engineer person who has looked at this issue to make these changes? They're not going anywhere. And again, this impacts the readiness of the US Navy to perform its mission. It deals 
with the issue of maintaining the Mariners because the leave policy sucks. It deals with the leadership, which has fine people in it, but just not the leadership from the deck plates that need to be there to be able to talk about what the capabilities and limitations are of the ships and the Mariners and the status that you give these Mariners. I know some of you are going to sit there and say they don't deserve to be veterans and, and get a DD-214. Fine, call it something different. But if you're going to treat them and have them sail right alongside, as those pictures showed you that it do, and operate in a vessel where the only difference you can tell is they have a blue and gold stripe around the stack, no other people can tell that difference. They're going to be as targeted as any other. So you can't tell me that, that the Chinese, the Russians, or whoever we're fighting will not target those vessels and consider them U.S. Navy warships, just like they would consider everything else. This is a fundamental problem that needs to be addressed. And hopefully this video gets the ball rolling. Not sure it will, but I'm going to take a try at it. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you're with Military Seal of Command, probably not. If you're in the fleet, I appreciate it. Let me know. Give it a thumbs up. Share it across social media. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell to be alerted about new videos as they come out. And if you can, support the channel by one of two ways. Hit that super thanks button below or go on over to Patreon and become a patron of the page. Give me the time and effort I need to put these videos together and make an enemy of quite a few people in the U.S. Navy probably today. But don't care. It, it's something that needs to be said, and I'm going to say it. And if I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But you know what? I, I hear enough from the Mariners out there. I know what I'm talking about on this one. So until our next video, this is Sal signing off.